We are to our last speaker. Thank you for your patience. We have been a real in the ultra marathon here, that's for sure. I saved Ursula for last because um, she, she looks at strict, hard, detail science as well as the big picture. So Ursula earned um, her um, uh, PhD at uh, Harvard University where she then taught for several years before she moved um, at, to the University of uh, or Washington University in St. Louis where she's a professor of biology. She's written three editions of the widely adapted textbook, Genetics, and has served in numerous capacities in international biomedical arenas. That's the hard science stuff that she does. She's also on the uh, Council of the Religion, uh, the Institute for the Religion in, for religion in the Age of Science. Uh, and she's written um, a really important book, I think, one of the most important you can read in terms of how can you be a spiritual person if you're an atheist, a skeptic, a humanist, you don't believe in God or whatever, where does your spirituality come from? The sacred depths of nature is the answer to that question, or at least one really good answer to that question. She's also on the editorial board of Zygon, which is sort of the premier journal of religion and science. Uh, and you can catch her on PBS and NPR and various television shows where she's become, because of her book, it was a bestseller, she's become kind of the premier talking head, as it were, of that whole subject. That is spirituality from a scientific point of view. Please help me welcome Ursula. Good enough. Hi. Well, it's, can you hear me? Is this good? Um, it's hard to be the mop-up person, but what I'm going to do is a big overview kind of thing and try as I go along, even though I prepared this talk before I came here, it turns out that a lot of the things that I want to say are uh, things that other people have covered, and so perhaps this will get this so I can, all right. Um, perhaps this will sort of serve to let you sit back and kind of think of the whole thing. Um, this title is the title that I gave, used at the Esalen Talks, and um, Michael said he wanted me to do the same thing here. Um, the trouble was that he said he wanted me to do the exact same thing. Then I had an hour, and now I have half an hour. But I've cut, and I think I'm going to be able to make it fine, or at least I was able to in my uh, bedroom at home. Um, okay, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about represents a lot of conversation and interaction over the years with Terry Deacon. Um, and he is very important in my thinking and all of this. And he gave us this very uh, wonderful quote in his book, The Symbolic Species. Biologically, we are just another ape. Mentally, we are a whole new phylum of organism. And here is our family tree with our um, other apes. I'm first going to talk about the concept emergence, and emergence is used in all sorts of hand-wavy kind of ways. I'm going to try to give it a little bit of uh, meat, and then talk about the emergence of awareness, brains, and symbolic minds. And then, at the end, a little bit on morality, because that was also in my title. So first, emergent properties or processes. So emergence relates to what happens when atoms, ultimately, interact, um, and when they do, their relationship to one another can generate something else or something more from nothing but. That's kind of the t-shirt slogan for an emergent property. And we find them all over the non-living world. So here's uh, water and a water spider on it. And this surface tension is, for example, an emergent property. So. This is nothing but water molecules if we reduce, and of course we can reduce the water molecules to um, their quarks if we want to, but it's also something that when water molecules get together in liquid form, they create this surface tension, this something more. It emerges. And similarly, again with a snowflake, uh, it's nothing but water molecules, but in this case, the initial and boundary conditions of how the water molecules interact with each other as they move through different temperatures and humidities generates different uh, patterns of uh, crystal growth, and so we get this emergent property of the snowflake's patterns. Now, a snowflake itself is just an um, evanescent phenomenon. Snowflakes don't have kids and that kind of thing, but it turns out that when we think about biology, what we have in biology is also emergent properties. 
So the difference is, though, that in this case, they're encoded and remembered. And we call these emergent properties traits. In biology, not only are these traits remembered, but because they're remembered, the very fact that they're remembered means that they can evolve. So they're encoded in genes and their regulatory elements. And as we know, information degrades and particularly DNA molecules can mutate. So we get these variant traits and then organisms that traits that are better adapted to their circumstances are more likely to transmit these instructions to their offspring. And all I've just said is Darwinian natural selection, but putting it in the context of traits. And here's a very important thing that isn't often brought up, particularly in a lot of the gene-centered ways of thinking about um, evolution, which is that natural selection doesn't see genes at all. It doesn't have any idea what genes or proteins are in there, important as they are for getting the result. Um, natural selection sees these traits and is completely blind to how they're generated. So emergent properties then, this whole idea of having them is really important for everything having to do with the evolution of life. Once you get an emergent property, a trait of some sort, that's encoded and expressed in an organism, then as these diverge, you can sometimes get new traits sort of coming out from existing ones. So you can say that traits beget traits, or emergent properties beget emergent properties. And we could illustrate this in a number of ways, but one, we could look at the evolution of awareness, which begins to take us into what we're thinking about here. So if we look at awareness, we can say an awareness is just an organism's ability to detect some sort of a sign out in the environment, a molecule, another organism, all sorts of levels, and respond to it in some sort of an appropriate fashion. So cells are aware of their environment, and the nothing but in this case is the receptors and the signaling molecules that are in the cell that allow this awareness to occur. And then we have cellular awareness is the nothing but in neural awareness, which are nerves, but they have these additional interesting properties of being able to uh, move over long distances. But in the end, they're just working like cells with neurotransmitters and receptors. Once neurons came into evolutionary being, we quickly probably have brains, the idea of places where neurons just talk to each other as opposed to running the organism. And then in our own lineage, we come to brain-based awareness giving rise to these language-based uh, symbolic minds, and then finally self-awareness. So I'll be talking about these in a minute. But first, let's think about brain development a little bit because that hasn't really been covered here. And there's an important difference between our kinds of brains and the brain, for example, of something like a worm. And that is that a worm's brain is really determined. You can go in any worm. It always has 302 neurons. They're always at the same place. You can always figure out what you're doing. And uh, the worm has, therefore, by definition, totally stereotypic uh, kinds of behavior. If you go to a mammal, by contrast, there's it's a completely different game in terms of making a mammalian brain. There are billions of neurons in every one of these brains, and the embryonic neurons grow out into the cranium with very minimal instructions. They're, you know, they're, they know that they're supposed to go and where they're supposed to do, but a lot of what happens has to do with the other neurons they encounter, what kinds of growth factors they secrete, and so on. And it's, so it's a very emergent process, if I may, and um, rather than anything that's fixed. And because of this, mammalian brains are wonderfully evolvable. That is, they, because they're emergent, because what happens first influences what happens next and what happens next, you get a situation where small heritable changes just differences the numbers of neurons that are growing out or where they happen to go, something can be encoded such that 
you get a very different result as an outcome, as opposed to something like a worm brain, where you have to sort of change it one neuron at a time. So a nice example of the evolvability of the mammalian brain is this blind mole rat. So here's a typical rodent with um, <coughs> neurons going into the brain from the eye and the ear and touch and uh, going to these regions of the cortex that are involved in these. The blind mole rat is blind, and, uh, uh, blind because it lives underground, and so any mutations that influence its ability to make an eye are not selected against because he can't see, there's nothing to see down there anyway. And so, as with other animals who live in the dark, there's a reduction in the eye and in the input to the brain. But what happens is that these other neurons come in here and take over this visual cortex and turn it into auditory and tactile. That is, the cortex isn't there to be visual. It is influenced by the input that comes into it. And this is then a way that we can get an entirely different kind of brain because there's nothing very determined about the whole process. Another way that we can think of as the mammalian brain being evolvable is just this whole size business that was been mentioned earlier. You can, just by having a few extra divisions, um, get a whole new part of brains that are now cells that are kind of looking around and can have new opportunities. And this is, for example, the human brain and the <coughs> intuited um, embryonic stem cell production in the embryonic brain. And here's the part as to which percent is based on body size. And what we see is that there's a whole lot of our brain, as we know, that is much larger than expected on the basis of the body size. And this generates the possibility of new synaptic opportunities. So with that much background, we can now look at very speculative, I might say, um, but I hope interesting to you, ideas about what might have happened during hominid evolution to get us the kinds of brains and minds that we have. Most people in evolutionary biology, and that's what I do for a living, is think about common ancestors. And when we see modern organisms that we're comparing, if we see lots of traits that they have in common, we assume that the common ancestor also had those traits. Whereas if we see something that's different in the two modern organisms, we figure that those differences arise, arose since they last had their common ancestor. And if we make a list of, then of mental traits that we share with chimpanzees and bonobos, the list is long. I mean, it's a lot longer than this, but there's intelligence, the social lifestyle, dependence on nurture for mental development in the kids, the same spectrum of, of temperaments and learning by imitation and by experience. So there's lots of ways that we're not different from them at all. The most distinctive human trait, and the one I'll focus on, and one that uh, Frank, uh, I mean Hank also lifted up for us, is that we have these <clears throat> ability to transmit cultural understandings via symbolic language. So that's what I want to focus on my remarks on, is what do we mean by that? OK, so symbolic language, all lots of animals communicate, of course. But symbolic language is something else. Um, it involves <clears throat> having these abstractions that we call words. Um, and we have these indices in our brains that these words somehow access. And then we can just manipulate these words syntactically um, using uh, the rules that languages follow. And we get these emergent concepts that have a life of their own. They can go into imaginative states and planning ahead and all the other things. And we can reconceptualize old ideas to get new ideas. So language really is a new kid on the block. There's nothing like it in the animal world. And importantly, also, 
what we do with this language is not only to learn by imitation, which other animals can do, but there's a very distinct thing that humans do, which is to teach, to explain, to point, to indicate what's going on, as opposed to learning just by watching others. And this is also language-based. And as Hank pointed out, it turns out that most of this new stuff that we're so proud of that came through um, in our hominid evolution in the enlargement of our brain size is involved with generating language. We don't know how it works yet. It's going to be a fascinating problem, equally interesting uh, as figuring out what consciousness is. And indeed, what I'll try to at least suggest is that, and Hank has also made this uh, point also, that maybe the two projects aren't that far apart from each other. So if we assume then um, that this enlargement of the human brain uh, and this rewiring perhaps of the human brain had to do with a reconfiguration for language skills, what kinds of ways could we even think about how that might have occurred? What kind of scenarios? And I'm going to present you with two and just see what you think. So the first scenario is called cultural masking. And the basic idea of masking is uh, explained in the next two slides. A species is, that's, gen that's hardwired to do something uh, in its lifestyle, uh, we know that that's true for all behaviors. But if the function becomes available to the species from the outside, then we're sort of in the same situation as we are with the blind mole rat. That is, if a mutation occurs in that original function such that it no longer occurs, it doesn't matter because the function is already supplied from the outside. And so the organism doesn't need this to be genetically hardwired anymore. Natural selection therefore doesn't act on these mutations, and so they tend to degrade. And there's a very, there are a number of examples of this, but my favorite is the one of vitamin C. So most organisms make ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, and it's essential for their survival. But the idea is that apes, when they started eating fruit, fruit has a lot of vitamin C in it. And as a result, mutations and enzymes involved in synthesizing vitamin C were not selected against because you're already getting plenty of vitamin, of ascorbic acid from the fruit. So as a result, humans and chimps is actually a pseudogene in our genome that used to be the enzyme in the last step in making vitamin C. It's now degraded and we are now addicted to vitamin C from the outside. So this same idea could be applied then to humans in terms of culture. That culture, once we started having culture and getting our information from culture um, during hominid evolution, that this masked the need for redundant heritable mental pathways and that these degraded and that this is why I talked about this whole idea of the um, evolvable mammalian brain. If you have pathways that are degrading, this frees up brain space, and I use the word in huge quotes, um, to reconfigure the kinds of minds that we have that are dependent on, that can do this symbolic language, and hence acquire the cultural information that means that the instinctive part isn't necessary anymore. And the key thing here then is if anything like this is going on, and it's certainly the case in any case, is that hominids are dependent on culture for survival. We're addicted to it. Addicted to it for these understandings and for the language that we learn from it. Many have s suggested why it is that we need language. There's a the whole thing about, you know, man the tool maker and how you have to have language to make tools, which never, I could never figure out. There's selection 
uh, nat se sexual selection scenarios. But the one I'm going to try to offer is my second scenario, which is the whole idea of niche construction. So the niche construction idea is best theme seen by thinking about the beaver. So beavers are rodents that do this extraordinary thing of chopping down trees and building dams. And if you look at a beaver, it's all of everything about beaverness has to do with this activity. They have these tails, they, have, they can swim, whereas most mice can just do this. They got these big teeth. Everything is about making these ponds, and they live in these ponds and uh, are then uh, protected from predators as a result. So the beaver then constructs dams and then is selected for its capacity to construct and thrive in these dam-created aquatic niches. They're artificial. Their beaver has to do, make these things, him or herself. And humans, I think we might say, construct cultures. Well, we might not might say, we do construct cultures. And we're selected for our capacity to construct and thrive in these culture-created mental niches. So what we get then, this is the important point, is a three-way coevolution. So two-way coevolutions you see all the time. You know, this changes and therefore that changes and it goes like this. But here we have a much more interesting possibility, which is that there are three parameters that are co-evolving, which means that if two change, the third one, you know, it gets much more complicated. And the co-evolution goes as follows, that human culture is encoded in and acquired by symbolic languages. Symbolic languages have been selected for their ability to be learnable by children's brains, and children's brains have been selected for their ability to acquire languages. And so the ability to have these language encoded cultural understandings is all co-evolving with the emergence of these symbolic minds. And since these ideas have come to me, mostly through Terry, it's really quite dramatically changed my way that I think about humans. So now we come to what you guys have been calling consciousness. So consciousness, from my perspective, just to put one more chip into the ring, um, I think that, you know, my cat is conscious. I mean, you know, she takes in what happens and she makes decisions and stuff like that. And I think, for me, it's more helpful to think about consciousness uh, as a brain-based phenomenon and to think of what we do is this other Thing that my favorite word for it is actually the narrative self. And there are quotes like this from Jerry Fodor, just another one of how, you know, how impossible it is to think that anything, that material could be conscious. Um, but I think that it's also important to say that that is a problem, but that a lot of the articulations that we've heard today are more to do with this uh, awareness of self, uh, the self-awareness that we do. And I agree with Hank in, uh, in particular that a lot of that is, has to do with language competent minds, um, that we really are telling ourselves stories and talking to ourselves and uh, that it's something clearly that's popping through, but it's popping through, I think, the thing that we really need to understand or at least the research project that I think is best for understanding consciousness is to understand more about language and how it works. So finally, just a little squib on moral understandings and all of this has, a lot of this has been said um, already this afternoon um, and particularly with a lot of wonderful and exciting new stuff on uh, uh, brain-based aspects of this. But in the same kind of thinking, here's how I come out on this. So first of all, the idea that moral understandings come from the beyond is not going to fly here. Um, <laughs> the <clears throat> idea that it has to do with just human reason um, 
reasoning is part of it, but I think that there's a much more interesting idea that comes through as we think about the evolution of the human. And that is that it's in our primate nature to be moral. It's natural to be moral. So let me develop that argument um, and then we can close. So we are social organisms and that is a very important piece of understanding who we are. All organisms are self-interested. I mean, by definition, that's a definition of an organism. An organism that isn't self-interested enough to get food and protect itself and stuff, you know, doesn't make it. So self-interest goes with the territory. Social lineages, at the least, engage in overlaps of self-interest. That's basically a definition, a minimalist definition of a social org lineage. And so there are dolphins and wolves and everything, and every, they all have different ways that they cooperate to uh, do this. In primate lineages, we see lots of examples of kin altruism. We see strategic reciprocity, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, and a whole hierarchical system of who's alpha and so on. And all of this is very well understood and stabilizes the group. I would say that we have all of that uh, ourselves in our economic and political systems. But in addition, in non-human primates, we also encounter what we could call moral sentiments. And several others have talked about this already. But let's just sort of, can you see this or the lights? It's okay. Okay, well, so this is a troop of bonobos and uh, illustrates sort of the first kinds of things. What goes on here in terms of these social interactions is a lot of hierarchical uh, considerations, some strategic reciprocity of who gets food and so on. So this is basically their political economic system showing up here. But when we talk about morality, we're usually not talking about political and economic systems. We're talking about other stuff. And we don't have to look very hard to find the other stuff in these animals. Uh, and Franz de Waal and others have spent uh, a lot of time reminding us of this. They have very wonderful interactions with their children. And indeed, they play with their kids. Uh, uh, this whole play thing um, is really troop-wide, and so you play with everybody's babies um, throughout the time that uh, you can. They are very affectionate with each other, not only as children, but also as adults. This whole grooming ritual that they do, they have friendships, their friendships are very important and long-lasting, and uh, animals that don't have friends are miserable. And there are lots of examples of things like this. This chimp has been injured and this other one is looking and again, because of our uh, uh, intuition, I think we can look at these faces and look at these behaviors and sense uh, it's not, I don't think it's just sort of reading in and oh, isn't it cute how this ape is like a human. Uh, the people who have been out in the field living with these animals say that emotionally they're very much like we are. So the proposal about our morality sort of goes as follows, that language generates the capacity in general, but in morality in particular here, to experience and transfigure our pro-social primate minds. So the idea is that as we evolved along our own lineage over the last five million years, our ape and moral sentiments were not left in the evolutionary dustbin. But it's not like we experience them the way apes experience them either. We experience them the way human minds experience things, which is this symbolic way. So if we make our last list here, we can make a list, and this one sort of makes sense to a lot of people, that sex, which is of course all the way through the animals, all through the eukaryotes, um, 
there's an emergent way, a symbolic way of thinking about it that has to do with sexuality. That nurture, the nurture that we see with these animals with their kids, transports into care, empathy into compassion, reciprocity into fair-mindedness, our concepts of justice, and perhaps more controversial, but I believe that this whole notion of hierarchy and seeing things that are larger and smaller than yourself has a lot to do with what is a very important emotion from my perspective, and that's our capacity for reverence. And then just simple knowledge when infused with all of our other understandings generates our capacity for mindfulness. So that's all very well, but there's this whole thing about moral motivation. Um, what motivates you to be moral? Why would you do it? And there are cultural influences, of course, of reward and punishment, some of which have been talked about here. There's a <coughs> rush of oxytocin, perhaps. But I would say that the rushes of oxytocin and lots of other complicated things that are going on with us neurophysiologically, need to be coupled somehow with a very interesting to me human capacity that actually um, David Hume talked about a lot in his philosophical writings, that we experience moral beauty. And it's, it's very interesting when we talk about, you know, like the firefighters at 9-11 or something like that, there's this, you know, you put your hand over your heart. Everybody does it. I saw the people in India doing that and talking about these things. And I think what moral beauty is and why we are so responsive to it is something that should be talked about a lot more. Lastly, of course, the thing that gets in the way of these moral sentiments and seeking moral beauty, beauty the most is, of course, what we can call toxic self-interest as opposed to just self-maintaining self-interest that goes with all social organisms. And it's my proposition, the last one I'll make, oh no, one more, uh, that this toxic self-interest is particularly exacerbated by stress. So bonobos, for example, the males are never observed to fight in the, in the uh, jungle, but they actually can damage each other very severely when they're put into zoos. And it can also be manipulated by culture so that this inherent idea of doing self-preservation can be manipulated into fearfulness and resource acquisition, again, a normal function, can be manipulated as to um, a need for more or greed. And I see fear and greed as being huge problems in our time. Often when I talk about this, people come up and say, well, what about xenophobia? And what about the fact that, you know, all animals, all primates just sort of trash their environment, don't think about anything? And I think that we could say that xenophobia and ecological indifference, we can call it, were once adaptive. You know, it, it doesn't matter in the jungle whether you trash what you're eating because there's more stuff right in the next um, region. And xenophobia, if you're a social group, particularly under stress and other troops are trying to get into your face, um, is, you know, probably a, an adaptive thing. And we clearly have uh, struggles with both xenophobia and ecological indifference in our heritage. But I'd like to leave you with the idea that I think is really important for particularly an educated group like this to understand, which is that these are both errors. You know, they were adaptive at the time, but they're erroneous. Because we now understand that, you know, there's no such thing as other if we take all of life, that we all have a common ancestor, that we're all share uh, many of our genes and uh, that it's when you, you know, what is other, what is xenophobia anyway? And that becomes even more uh, apparent when we look at our 
lineage once again, thinking about our common ancestry with the apes, but also, of course, the obvious fact that all of us are related to humans that lived in Africa um, 100 or so thousand years ago. Everyone in this room has an ancestor that had black skin, and it's just, xenophobia is just bullshit. <laughs> And finally, of course, ecological indifference is, makes a whole lot of sense when your entire turf is uh, the next trees in the jungle. But uh, we now understand that this is where we really live. Uh, it's very uh, um, uh, balanced. It's very important for us to pay complete attention to uh, keeping it as beautiful as it is. Thank you. <laughs>